Welcome to Black and White Cairo Ministries, where Christ is meeting you in a personal view. I'm Father John Roberts. I'm so delighted that you're joining me today as we read once more from the Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter, the first eight verses. Before we begin, why don't we open with a word of prayer? The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Blessed Lord, who calls all holy scriptures, to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all things, these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. By the end, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of of the birth pains, the Gospel of the Lord. Do you remember the story of Little Red Riding Hood? Upon the path, she was met by the big bad wolf, who found out that she was going to Granny's house. And knowing that he couldn't get her to give her lunch basket to him, he decided to be coy, and he ran ahead of her and he ousted Granny, and he put on her clothing, her spectacles, her hat, and crawled into her bed. So that when the unsuspecting Little Red Riding Hood came along, his intent was to deceive her and ultimately get much more than her bag of goodies. She comes in, and she notices right away that Granny is looking ill because Granny's in the bed. And... The wolf says, why don't you come closer? And so Little Red Riding Hood comes a little closer. And when she does, she says, oh my granny, what big eyes you have. And we all know the response was, better to see you with, my dear, come a little closer. And as she gets a little closer, she says, oh my, what a big nose you have. And of course, we know the response to that. And then come closer, come closer to Little Red Riding Hood says, Oh my, what big teeth you have. And then the wolf jumps up and says, Better to eat you with. And of course the hunter came in and Little Red Riding Hood was saved and the story goes that the, the wolf was put to death. But there was deception. Let us not be deceived by the religion of quantity. I believe that God wants us to grow, and growth can occur quantitatively and qualitatively. I've spoken of this many, many times. But here in our scripture today, the disciples say, look, come closer, and look at what large stones these are that make up the temple. They were very much impressed by the grandeur that they didn't realize that they were being deceived by an institution that had lost its moral and ethical footing that prioritized the quality of spiritual life. Jesus rebuts them by saying, Look, I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another. All are going to be thrown down. This ultimate ousting of the old guard, the old establishment, delighted the disciples because now they're thinking that they will be part of the new kingdom and they will have a special place with the new ruler, which would be Jesus, they presumed. 
So they're curious, how is this going to happen? Tell us about it. Because he says that he will actually build these things back in three days. We hear this later in the Gospel. He's telling them that the stones have accumulated, and the stones represent the pride and the hypocrisy of people who have turned to the religion of politics. And politics is always about a self-agenda. And the agenda reveals the true wolf that lurks within, which is ourselves. It's hard to say that we can be trusted, but it's true. Men who were brought into the rabbinical order to be great priests were there only to preserve and protect stones. But they had been heaped so high. They were such a fortress that... A simple widow or a leper or somebody that truly needed guidance and assistance couldn't even find entrance. Jesus was appalled by this and he said, look, I'm telling you this is what's going to happen. And he also goes further to say that it doesn't just happen here at the temple because the temple is corrupted. It's become a community center. It's become a political cornerstone. It's become an instrument of pride, stone upon stone, as one big stone of pride comes on top of another. He's saying that it affects the entire city, it infects the entire nation, and it infects the entire world. This deceit has got to stop. But we are called to come closer to it. Look closely into your own heart. Why do you come to church? Is it so that you will have some particular acclaim in the community? Look, I go to that church, and that church does this. And I am the head of this organization, or this organization. And therefore, look at how important I am. And because you may be gazing so much about your fame and importance and your career climb that's associated with the politics that have been imported into the church. Maybe you think there's some advancement, some increase in quantity. But Jesus, in this passage, doesn't care at all about the religion of quantity. He is more concerned about the religion of quality, the quality of life. How is this a center of worship to the extent that all people are called to bow down and worship the Lord, not worship man, not worship the stones that have historically been built, but to worship God himself. Are people contrite? Are people submitting their lives? Are they forging ahead and giving a tithe in which it is an expression of love for the Creator who gave them their life? When the church falls, when the church has been stripped out of the equation of being the moral and ethical hinge point, the community will suffer. If the community suffers, the county suffers. If the county suffers, the state suffers. And if the state suffers, the nation suffers. There will be plagues, there will be famines, there will be wars, there will be dissensions, and it will all be political, it will all be ugly, and they will all say it was because, perhaps, of religious fanatics. I pray that you will be obsessed with the love of Christ, so that you will bring the basket of God's goodness and grace to all people who seek it. The stones of pride, if they are on you, if they are in you, I pray that you will relinquish that. Break them down. Let God come in and let him restore you and build you up once more. These words are made for our edification, for our sanctity of life, and you are to mark them, to read them, and inwardly digest them, just as it said in our prayer this morning. Do not be alarmed. These things will take place because we're human beings, and human beings know no better than to learn from how far they fall. They must get up. And only by the love of Christ, only by His help, are we able to rebuild the temple. May God bless you for the hearing of this word. And I ask you to respond to this particular episode 
by talking about the mighty stones and the fortresses that you have seen go up in your own life and the world around you, the things that appall you, the things that you hope will be brought down low and that God will rise up again. And at the center of all this, there's Christ. And at the center of Christ, we find the love that he has and shares for his holy Catholic and apostolic church. As always, go forth in the name of Christ. Thank you.